Good afternoon, my name is Camilo Torres. I'm joined by my teammates Cindy Vargas, Rafael Diaz, Adam Webster. We are doing the upper landing payload for the NASA Star Launch Competition. This is uh, for the FIU chapter of the ASM Club uh, to compete in NASA. Okay. So, a uh, quick description uh, we have for the 2017 NASA Computer Launch, we have two parts, which is the rocket, which is designed and manufactured, a rocket that is able to reach an apogee of 5,280 feet, and also the payload, which is needed to have target protection and upright landing. So, that's where our senior came in. That was our task. Uh, so, we had to establish the establish descent and an upright landing for the project. Uh, our motivation, uh, these are the things that we see in the aerospace industry and space industry as well. We needed to find uh, in-flight stability that is required for sensors and also to address the upright landing that is required for some of the payloads, something that you see nowadays with SpaceX. As can be seen, uh, something that's cost effective. So when you reuse the booster, you're able to save that for other uses. So you can do that in Blue Origin and SpaceX. Uh, the your survey for multi-copters, just an introduction, so that, um, we use motors for the, for the quadcopter. Uh, when we increase the number of motors, we have several things happening. We have more thrust, increased stability, but we also have a uh, higher power requirement and more weight. Here are some of the types of configurations. We have the tricopter, three motors, quadcopter, two different types, the uh, Y4 and Y6, which are coaxial motor configurations. We have the X-copter, which has six motors. Uh, we're between the hexacopter and the quadcopter. The hexacopter is able to operate even there, so if there's failure in one of the motors, it still has stability. But we chose to go with the quadcopter because of its less cost and less weight. Um, so there are several design specifications and considerations we had to uh, be mindful of um, to um, adhere to NASA's requirements and ASLE's uh, requirements too. So the quadcopter was going to be retrofitted into the uh, rocket's main fuselage. Uh, so the NASA student launch uh, team gave us a maximum length of 12 inches work width, uh, width, work width as, well, as well as an outer diameter of 5.39. Um, the quadcopter's main purpose was to house the camera, which is the payload in this experiment, and it would be located at the bottom of the quadcopter. Um, other considerations that had to be considered were um, how we were going to eject the quadcopter from the rockets, how we were going to extend the appendages autonom autonomously, um, be mindful of flight stability, vertical landing, and also we had to adhere to <coughs> the safety requirement of having a maximum kinetic energy of 75 foot pound force. So we had a parachute of three feet and with a pay, uh, our, pay, our quadcopter that weighs 3.7 pounds, the estimated kinetic, kinetic energy is 26.7 foot pound force. Uh, during the project, we have varying, we have varying designs from which to choose from, and all these change as well as long as all these change as we went through uh, manufacturing, and we had to design uh, different. Uh, we have to decide which materials and mechanisms to use. For our first design, as you can see in the picture, we have uh, a lot of spring hinges for the landing gear. Uh, this proved to be difficult because we had to figure out how that mechanism would work out, and as well as the propeller arms at the top, uh, we couldn't figure out how to do that, so we decided to go to the next design. Our second uh, design alternative uh, was more concrete as we dealt with the assembly and the different materials we would use. As you can see in this picture, our landing gear is connected to our propeller arms. And in this system, uh, both the arms and the landing gear would come out simultaneously. This also proved to be quite difficult in figuring out the mechanism, so we decided to further uh, progress our designs. Uh, for our final design, as you can see here, uh, we decided to remove the landing gear completely and go with uh, lower the propeller arms down to the base of the park cover so as to serve as, um, as a landing gear. Uh, here are, here is the final uh, design in its extended and its total weight com uh, configuration. Um, the way that the propeller arms work are, they are spring hinged. They are connected to the spring and they're spring loaded. The way that they are maintained upright are, is through the latch system that is connected to a servo. So once it reaches a certain height, the servo latch will rotate and the arms can go ahead down. When choosing the motors for the quadcopter, uh, we made use of thrust data tables. Uh, motor manufacturers sometimes uh, provide uh, thrust data tables for what they do 
is they tell you how much thrust you can expect from a motor given a certain amount of voltage that's being supplied, a certain amount of, a certain percentage of throttle that's being applied, as well as the length and pitch of the propellers. Uh, now, before we can use those thrust data tables, we have to determine how much thrust we needed. Now, for a typical uh, photographic uh, multi-copter, you would use a thrust to weight ratio of about 1.5, but we need to make sure that our quadcopter is going to be capable of uh, reaching a hover a velocity of zero uh, from terminal velocity. Uh, so we did a deeper analysis than that. Uh, we did a force analysis, and the forces acting on the quadcopter are going to be the thrust from the four motors, the weight of the quadcopter, the force from drag from the parachute, and the force from drag from the shape of the quadcopter itself. When we uh, rewrite that in terms of velocity, we get a differential equation. And we can use that to solve for what the terminal velocity would be. Once we know the terminal velocity, we're able to figure out what the kinetic energy upon impact would be just in case all of the motors failed. This is for NASA safety standards. Uh, and then we could also use that equation to determine how much time will pass and how much distance it will travel when going from terminal velocity to a hover velocity of zero. So for our quad copy with a weight of 3.7 pounds and a, thrust, a total thrust of 6.4 pounds, we can, accept, we can expect to reach an average speed within one second and seven feet. And we would use that information uh, just to help us determine when we should begin the very final landing approach. All right, taking the uh, force analysis just further uh, in case we ever need in the future to uh, add weight or expand our quadcopter at all, uh, we see as we increase the weight of the payload or the weight of the quadcopter, uh, the terminal velocity increases. Uh, once we have that, we can see how the kinetic energy increases. Uh, the red line that you see there is 75 foot pounds of energy. That was NASA's uh, uh, maximum. And you can see that the quadcopter could weigh as much as about 6.25 pounds and still be within NASA's safety standards. Okay, so uh, we are doing more uh, analysis here comparing weight and thrust uh, to figure out how much time it will take to reach hover and also how much distance it will travel to reach hover. If you look at the left side of the graph where it's flat, that's where the weight of the quadcopter exceeds the thrust uh, from the motor. So in that case, you can never uh, achieve a hovering space uh, status of, of zero velocity. The most you'll do is uh, reduce your terminal velocity. Uh, however, once your thrust exceeds your weight, uh, you can see the time to hover and the distance to hover. The blue plane that you see there uh, is done just to kind of help uh, understand the graph here. The blue plane represents when the thrust exceeds the weight by exactly half a pound. Okay? So we see if that's the case, uh, that if you have a quadcopter that weighs six pounds and you're applying six and a half pounds of thrust, if you follow the, that intersection back, you'll see that you can reach a hover within four seconds and in under 30 feet. Um, so for the structure of our quadcopter, we decided to use a G12 uh, fiberglass coupler and G10 uh, circular bulk heads. G12 fiberglass and G10 uh, fiberglass is uh, used for uh, model rocketry, so we decided to use those um, uh, materials. We also use acrylic high impact for the bottom bulk heads, so um, the camera will be able to see through. Um, the smooth surface ensures that there's an easy, easy ejection of and maximizes the internal volume, and the threaded steel rods help absorb uh, most of the impact that might be. So we knew that um, if we cut sections into the coupler, we would weaken it, so we decided to do a couple of simulations. Uh, first one, we did uh, a coupler alone, and then uh, the second set of uh, simulations, we did a coupler with uh, threaded rods. So um, for the first simulation, we did a drop test from three feet, and uh, as can be seen, uh, most of the, the, the impact is absorbed um, near the bottom and the middle of the uh, coupler. And then we did a drop test at a velocity of 70.5 feet per second. And here, um, the maximum um, uh, stress experience is 33.3 tips. So now we did a simulation with rods. And um, as can be seen, most of the uh, impact is absorbed through the rods. And the internal, uh, the, the structure itself um, experiences a very, very low um, uh, stress. All right, this is the program that was involved in the quadcopter. Uh, as you can see, we start by reading the vertical velocity and the altitude, and we look for when our 
vertical velocity is negative, indicating that we're falling and that we are at a large altitude. So we're constantly checking for that. Once that is happening, we then pause for a parachute inflation. We then activate the servo to release the arms. We pause again to allow the arms to release. We then arm the motors. We enter a built-in land mode that is in the Arju copter uh, uh, software. Uh, we then begin reading the vertical velocity. Once the vertical velocity is approximately zero for about two seconds, we then disarm the motors, we display the pitch and the roll angles, and as long as those are both under five degrees, we declare that to be a uh, successful upright landing. Unfortunately, the programming was a major bottleneck for this entire project. Uh, we had researched some example code, uh, and then we had seen it was tested, and unfortunately, when we had finished uh, putting the electronics together for a sample quadcopter, when we uploaded that code, that code did not compile. And there were issues with the libraries for the Arju copter, with the Arju copter li libraries. Now, we were going with Arju copter because it was, in our research, the most um, widely supported uh, and most popular open source software for uh, quadcopters. We spent some time trying to resolve that issue with the libraries, but we couldn't. We then looked into Mission Planner software, which is more of a graphical user interface, also part of the Arju Pilot uh, project. Uh, and we did have uh, some contact with Michael Oborn, the designer and, um, and creator of, of Mission Planner. But it turned out to be too limited for the specific things that we wanted to do. Uh, however, we did know that Mission Planner uh, could read Python scripts. So we then looked into writing uh, this program using Python scripts. Uh, and unfortunately, we ran into another major bottleneck, and it had to do with entering the built-in land mode. There is a, specifically in the uh, information for Python scripting for Mission Planner, a certain specific line of code method for entering the land mode. And when we ran that one line of code, it didn't work. It just turned the motors off. So uh, we tried to resolve this a few different ways, and finally, we took it upon ourselves to write our own land mode procedure. And uh, we made a lot of progress with that, but unfortunately, we just ran out of time. This is some of uh, what we did as far as uh, the, involved in the programming. Uh, we had to do some radio calibration. This is for the emergency failsafe. We had to make sure that at any time uh, anything went wrong, if, if the people at NASA wanted us to take over the quadcopter, we could do so. So we had to calibrate the radio. Uh, we also had to know what pulse width modulations it would be expecting because the, uh, the Python scripting uh, needed to uh, basically spoof the radio, uh, radio frequencies. We did some testing of the barometer. The barometer is what we use to measure the altitude. So we did five tests over the course of 10 seconds to see uh, how stable the barometer was. Well, we saw that the uh, average um, test at, we saw that the average test at, um, uh, at ground level uh, was ranged from about 1.29 feet to 2.17 feet, uh, so not a big uh, variance there. And even though there was fluctuation uh, over time, it didn't fluctuate by more than two thirds of a foot. And seeing as the altitude was really only being used to determine when to release the arms and when to initiate the final landing sequence, these differences, this variation of one or two feet was not gonna be an issue. This is a simple uh, quadcopter that we had built, and this was just to test the base of the electronics and also to test that the, the servo was functioning and that the landing, uh, to test our landing program. Uh, you see we always kept it tethered at all times uh, with a tether capable of uh, 16 pounds of force. This is some of the output that we had during our testing. Uh, on the left, we are testing uh, detection of altitude and uh, releasing the arms as well as uh, arming the motors and entering land mode. So it is constantly outputting what altitude it was reading and checking that against a set altitude. And we see that function. Uh, a later test was for detecting upright landing, where uh, what we do is we constantly check in the altitude to make sure it's below a certain level. And then we check the vertical speed, making sure it, may, it stays between negative 0.2 and positive 0.2 meters per second. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, we also make sure that the throttle is at a minimum. And if that has held for two seconds, 
We consider that a, a landing. We then disarm the motors. We report the roll and the pitch angles. And if, as I said before, if they're both, both less than five degrees, we report that as an upright landing. Here we have the breakdown of the cost. Uh, we have the body of uh, the different parts. And then here we have the electronics. Our total cost was $751.87. Uh, this is an updated uh, Gantt chart for a timeline of all the tasks we had to do. And up until the final competition, as you can see, it's red because we were not able to compete. Uh, this is the division of the responsibilities we had to do with pre will balance between our members. And since we're working with NASA and working with high-powered rocketry, there are certain standards and regulations we must have tried to adhere to. Um, some of the important ones, such as the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA Code for Federal Regulations, uh, Part 107 is for small unmanned uh, systems. It, aircraft systems, it requires us to be registered. So we are, in fact, registered. There's our registration number. So we can uh, go ahead and test it as fly as we can. Uh, uh, in order to complete our global design criteria, our specifications for a report are both in metric and imperial units, and our documentation is available in English, Spanish, and Italian. Okay, for our future work, obviously we want to activate the onboard landing mode. Uh, we don't know why the, uh, the suggested code didn't work. Uh, if that's not possible to finish programming it ourselves. Now, it really needs to be on board. That's important. We were programming using Python script, which was uh, landing it using telemetry. And that, that there's a delay there. And that actually was an issue for us in our test that we discovered after some time. Uh, we also want to, uh, once we have the landing mode uh, working, we want to test the stabilization and adjust the PID uh, controller accordingly to make sure it's not oscillation uh, as it's trying to stabilize, and uh, of course, we want to launch. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> questions? Yeah, how, how do you measure altitude? Do you have an altimeter? Do you have to adjust? There's a barometer built into the flight controller. And do you adjust that before? Off or? We don't, uh, well, we read it before liftoff, or we read it when we first turn on the program. And uh, that's based off of, basically it's zeros based on where you are. And right. that is the value that we're constantly comparing okay. to throughout running the program. Is that upside down now, right there? No, that's, no, that's, that's right, right side. That's upright. Right. 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 Yeah, that's upright. Right. There's <laughs> bears that's here that's bear to come up to handle the load. Like this. Yeah, it does appear like the propeller should be above, but uh, keep in mind that there is going to be a parachute right. always pulling upwards. So we lower the center of gravity. Also. Yes, yeah, that's where most of the weight is. So the propellers are mostly there just to keep it stabilized. It's just going to fall. That's why we calculated terminal velocity. Yeah. When you did your drop test, you did, uh, was that 70 feet per second figure your terminal velocity? No, um, so that was my mistake. Um, I had done the simulations a couple times and my computer was crashing or whatever, so the last time I did it, I did 21.5 um, meters per second instead of uh, 21.5 feet per second. So um, we changed the information. So your analysis is ultra conservative? Yes. yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you do the test sideways? I did not. Um, the whole point was uh, for it to land um, vertically, so if it were to land um, sideways, then we would probably not be able to uh, meet the requirement of landing upright. And plus, since the, the um, since all the way is at the bottom, um, it would just land. Um, That's if you have a deployed parachute. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we have to deploy yeah. parachute. If the parachute doesn't deploy, I mean, that's what you would test terminal velocity, right? If your parachute doesn't deploy, this thing is falling out of the sky. The terminal velocity, well, for NASA's requirements, they're going to assume that a parachute deployed that for their safety oh, requirements. Uh, if this just fell from the sky from a mile up, yeah. we weren't going to build to make sure that we could survive that. That seems like, uh, like it will, that would be required a lot of reinforcement. It seems. So we mostly tested assuming that the parachute deployed. That's where the terminal velocity is 21.5 per second. Yeah, initially we had an uh, uh, you know, alternative that they required two parachutes, but they switched their requirements to just one. 
So we have to follow the standards. So, so your your what you're calling terminal velocity is assuming a deployed parachute. Deployed parachute, but the motor is not functioning. Okay. 